Hello, thank you for joining me here today at the Sanford Museum in our uh, archaeology area. So um, we apologize, we can't be doing this in person right now, so this is the next best thing. Um, hopefully this will just get you excited to come visit us here at the Sanford Museum. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, prehistory and prehistoric people. So how might a person learn about history? First of all, if we talk about history and what you guys know about history, probably from school, right? You might have to open a book, read about history, maybe get on the computer, um, learn about history, names, uh, places, dates, those sorts of things, right? Um, computer, even your phones, right? To check out some of that historic information. So. Those are the things that someone at some point in time had taken the time to write down and record those facts so that we have them later on to um, learn about. So that's history. So prehistory, if you think about what the word or prefix pre means, it means before. So before history, that would mean before there was a written language in, introduced to these folks. So um, those are the folks we're talking about today. These prehistoric people were the folks that did not have um, a true written language introduced to them yet. So um, we'll get into that in part two when we do our, our pottery puzzle and learn about how they um, created other ways to tell their stories uh, and pass along their history without uh, using a written language like we have today. So with that being said, we'll take a look at some of these really cool artifacts today um, by groups, which is uh, very similar to how we're grouped um, down here in the lower level of our museum. So we've got um, bone tools, we've got stone tools or lithics or, or what we would call things that are made out of rock, uh, and we've got ceramics, so anything made out of um, clay, which they would have dug out of a, a river bank or a creek bank to form their, their pots and so on. So uh, those are our three areas today, which is basically what you see behind me here. The uh, stone tools, the bone tools right behind me, and uh, the pottery or the ceramic section over here. So we can show you a little bit more of what's in the cases down here when we're all through as well. <clears throat> so um, keep in mind, we know there are, were lots of different prehistoric cultures, different groups of prehistoric people that lived here. So uh, we've got a little bit of, of several different cultures that lived in Northwest Iowa out here in front of me here today. Uh, but a good share of this is what we would call Mill Creek um, culture uh, and the things that um, that culture left behind. So what do we know about Mill Creek? Well, uh, for starters, we want to show you how we think uh, these folks live, what kind of structures they live in. So um, we're going back in time somewhere around 750 to almost a thousand years ago, right here in Northwest Iowa, if you've heard of Mill Creek, uh, runs through Cherokee County and up through Plymouth County. Um, we find a lot of this material along um, Mill Creek itself, uh, which is a tributary, of course, of the Little Sioux. So we find some of it along there as well. Um, if you think about why a culture would um, choose uh, along a waterway to make it their, their home or their village, um, same, re same reason we would today, okay? Or maybe um, it was a nice view, but primarily we know that that would be, of course, a water source for them. Uh, and usually where there's water, that brings in animals uh, and so on for them to hunt. So um, quite often you find a lot of these sites along um, waterways of some sort. So Mill Creek, this is how we uh, think these folks lived. Um, if you can imagine an extended family, so that would be you, uh, your parents, and maybe your grandparents, um, all your siblings, maybe even aunts and uncles, cousins, living in one structure. That is how we, we, we think maybe that the, the Mill Creek culture um, live in these kind of oval shaped houses. So uh, I'll bring this up just a little bit closer to you in a minute here, but grass thatched roofs um, and posts, okay, wooden posts. So not teepees, okay, we're not talking about teepees in, with this particular culture. So uh, they used what they had. So the, the posts being around, of course, the, the wood that they could find uh, and mud and grass thatched roofs and uh, mud daub walls. Um, 
right into the earth. So um, use what materials they had. Uh, if you take a look at this a little bit closer, uh, in there we have added in for you a couple of pit features. Okay, Inside uh, the house, of course, would have been uh, fire pits for cooking, right, and for warmth. Uh, and also uh, food pits for storing food or cash pits, okay, to keep wild animals out of it and keep it, keep it from spoiling. Um, and these pits out and around the edges of the house here uh, would be, of course, waste pits. So these fo folks made garbage just like we did. You wouldn't want that uh, in your house with you if you didn't want, you know, didn't have to live with it, you wouldn't want that in your house. So that would be, um, buried eventually, filled in with dirt, and a new waste pit would be started. So again, this is just Mill Creek culture. Not all of them um, built houses in the same fashion, but like I said, much of what's out here is um, Mill Creek uh, in origin. So this is their living structure. Now, what do we know about Mill Creek? We know um, they were farmers, so they learned to plant crops, things like pumpkin, squash, beans, uh, and those sorts of things. So farming was important to these folks, as well as, of course, hunting. You can see from <clears throat> the points, or the arrowheads, you might call them. Uh, we know that they were good hunters as well, skilled at hunting. So again, keeping in mind, this was all about um, survival for these folks. So keeping alive, finding enough food, finding enough water, having shelter. Um, so some artifacts here to look at. Taking a look at the bigger one here first. So bringing this in close, we know we're on bone tools at this particular point here. So looking at this big bone, this is a scapula, which is a shoulder blade. So um, shoulder blade from what animal is the question? So this is a shoulder blade of a bison. So you guys notice the um, table covering here, that is a bison hide. These were very, very large animals. So um, roamed in huge herds um, around this part of Iowa when these folks were around. So um, this scapula, if you take a, a look at the end of it here, is all worn off. So that's our first indication as an archaeologist. You would look at that and see that that has been used at that end. So um, again, these folks didn't have a written language. They didn't leave you know, a book behind telling us uh, what exactly they did with this and how they, they used it, but they believe that probably knowing that these folks were uh, farmers, this probably was some sort of an agricultural tool, maybe uh, even had a, a handle attached to it, we're not sure. Uh, but this end saw the use, so probably some sort of a digging tool, shovel, uh, or a hoe type of tool uh, for this one. And we know too that, um, and this one's kind of patched up, this is an actual artifact, so it's getting pretty old, uh, and bone dries and, and gets brittle, so it's cracking here, we've patched that up. But we know that they learned to use um, some of their stone tools here, I'll show you in just a few minutes, to um, cut smaller bone tools out of larger ones like this to make smaller bone tools. We'll show you that here too in just a moment. And this one's kind of fun just to study about for just a moment here. So take a look at that, see if you can identify whose jaw that is. So that is the bottom half uh, of a deer jaw found at an archaeological site. So um, exactly what it was used for, we're not positive. We know that the, the teeth are pretty well intact. They're not loose uh, at all. Front teeth are missing, little front ones there. Um, but if this wasn't used as a tool, it could simply be, um, you know, leftover garbage, left behind material um, that these folks didn't actually use at all. Or uh, maybe it was a tool. Uh, we've had all sorts of thoughts with this one. Uh, kids like to say, you know, toy gun, 
uh, or a boomerang kind of thing, hair comb or hair brush, I've heard lots of times. Uh, I, other ideas that have come up, maybe um, a harvesting type of tool where it would have um, stripped the grain off of, of the plant that they had grown uh, through the summertime. So um, it's a possibility. Like I said, though, the teeth are, are fairly uh, intact there. So may or may not have, have been a tool. We don't have all the answers to those sorts of things, but it was found uh, at an archeological site. So some other things that, that might um, turn up at an archeological site, just to give you an up close view here. These are uh, things mostly made of bone, like I mentioned. So here would be some of the, the smaller bone tools made out of a larger piece of bone. So after soaking that in water for a few days, bone gets a little uh, kind of rubbery and you could take a, a stone tool to it and cut some smaller things from that. Um, these two long pointed pieces here are also bone. Those are bird bones. So if you guys know about birds uh, and their bones, you know that they have hollow bones. So they will break um, pretty easily and then just sharpen them uh, on a rock and you have a pretty sharp needle-like tool. So those are called awls and we think that is probably what they use them for, uh, for things like sewing um, hides together um, or a leather punch to get through some of that thick uh, bison hide in particular. Uh, and if you look at these two little um, ornamentals, those are called, those are actually made of shell and not bone, but I want to talk about um, those holes that are in both of those. So uh, because we find artifacts, whether it's um, something made of bone uh, or something made out of clam shell, we do find, here's another one, um, artifacts that have holes drilled in them. Okay, so that tells us uh, that these folks had a drill uh, of some sort, some sort of drilling tool in order to do this. So this is how we think those sorts of things took place. Now this is um, our handmade um, version here at the museum. We've never uh, recovered a, a, a prehistoric drill, but um, we think something like this is probably what they had. Now, Keep in mind, they wouldn't have had, of course, nails, uh, like what's at the bottom of this one here, but instead replace that with uh, a sharpened stone point at the end, like a bit for a drill, a drill bit, right? And you have yourself um, a pretty sharp point there to drill holes into objects, okay? So how does this work? Look at this. Something like this, and again, we don't have all the answers to this um, for sure but something similar to this again replace that nail with a stone tip and you get this um, drill of wood and strips of leather here um, spinning back and forth kind of get a rhythm going and it absolutely does work uh, and, and put holes in things with a little bit of practice this is something that I've done several years so I've learned to do that pretty well but um, Again, replace that nail with a stone tip and you've got um, yourself a fairly sharp tool there. So let's go on to um, some of these other stone items here and the process of some of those things, um, how we think the processes um, happened to make those. Um, first one pretty obvious here. That would be an ax, of course, right? So know that we added um, the handle and we added the leather strip here. The artifact itself is the stone axe head. Okay, just to give you an idea of what it looked like as a finished product. Wood uh, and leather does not usually survive, you know, for a thousand years out in nature. So that would, would rot away and leave behind um, the artifact itself. So chopping tool, of course, an axe in its day would have been much sharper than it is. And we'll talk about how they sharpen some of these tools here. Here is another chopping tool. So this would be also called, you know, an ax head. Uh, but you should notice a difference here between this one uh, and this one. Okay, and this one we went ahead and put the handle on it for you uh, because it had a groove worn in it. So a prehistoric person took um, another rock and grooved uh, this axe head for the purpose of putting it on a 
handle, where this person did not. So if this has no groove um, made into it by another rock, that tells us probably this one was a handheld tool for chopping, okay? Although it is an ax head, um, that groove tells us a lot. Usually that indicates it had a handle um, with it at one point in time. Here's another example of uh, a grooved um, artifact or grooved um, lithic piece here. So this would be called a maul, M-A-U-L, okay? So think of that as, as a hammer, big hammer head. Of course, it would have had a handle because it was grooved, okay? Handle has now since disappeared. This one's kind of fun. Um, this is called a mano. Okay, again, we're looking at lithics, things that are all made of stone, okay, stone tools, fits really nicely in your hand. So that's not a coincidence in this, this particular example. And notice how flat that is. So again, like the um, scapula being used at the end there as a, a digging tool being worn down, probably similar situation with the mano. So we will call this a um, grinding tool. So what I don't have down here with me is the, the bottom half, the big bowl-shaped rock called the matate. Um, they would put their grain in that they grew and grind it. Okay, so uh, this has been worn down because it's been used on another rock to grind down a product. So um, rock on rock is eventually going to wear that down and that also wears um, the bowl shape into the other rock. So Mano and Matate are the two uh, pairs. They, they work together. We think they use them together. Okay, so that's the Mano. Uh, as far as the points go, maybe it's best to just show you this up close here first of all. So um, some different examples of things uh, that we find archaeological sites. Um, a little bit smaller in most cases. We've got um, knives. Okay, some of the larger things here, biface or a scraper, they would have maybe used that larger one to uh, scrape the fat off of uh, you know, a piece of, of animal hide to prepare it, um, to uh, preserve it. Um, some of the smaller ones, we sometimes call those bird points for um, hunting of smaller game, and that would include birds, of course, right? And different shaped points, and there's another one of those drill bits that we just showed. So scraping tool, they maybe would have used one of those scrapers to um, cut a, a smaller piece of bone from a large one, like a shoulder blade, right? To make a smaller um, bone tool, like we saw the, the pottery shaping piece of bone tool or um, a weaving tool made out of bone, maybe would have been cut by um, one of these stone tools right here, okay? And the braider. We'll get to the abrader here in just a second, but let's talk about how they made some of these cool points. Um, that was done in a process called flint napping. So flint, um, you heard of the flint stones, of course, we know it's a type of stone, uh, or makes you think of rock, right? So flint was actually, or is still, a, a common type of rock around here in Iowa. And again, like with the materials for their houses, they used what was available to them. So. Uh, taking a larger piece of stone, flint, um, you could hit this with a, a large rock, and this would splinter into um, some smaller flakes, okay? More like this, and it turns out they are, uh, with the way this rock, this particular type of rock will break, it breaks into some fairly sharp pieces when you do that. So these folks learned that you could take some of these um, smaller pieces then and use um, some different tools on them to shape them exactly how uh, they want to shape them. So for example, I'm not too good at this, but I will show you how flint napping works. So taking one of these smaller flakes and uh, for example, maybe this bone tool, this is a deer tine, okay, something they would have hunted, of course, the, the white-tailed deer, of course, were here as well. So using the point or tying off of one of those animals, and you put pressure um, around the edges of that little flake, kind of hear that crunching sound, and I uh, didn't do a lot of work, but I ended up um, notching, doing that small little 
um, notch in it by just putting pressure here. So they would work these edges until they got them into um, a usable form. So uh, like with anything, kind of a learning process and eventually they would get some that would, that would turn out pretty nicely. Some did not, some didn't break right. Uh, those would get thrown onto the ground and we find um, those as well um, uh, or broke while it was being made and that gets thrown on the ground. So we find some broken ones, we find unfinished ones, uh, we find some not so perfect ones, right? So here's some examples of some different ones we found in the area. These are not all Mill Creek. Um, but they do uh, help us identify the, the culture. So a lot of these particular groups had specific types um, of points that they made. So sometimes you find them notched on the sides uh, where they could have set that down into uh, a prepared stick, which would have become the arrow, right? Uh, or spear, um, and they would wrap that um, with other animal parts maybe they wouldn't want to eat, right? With some stuff called sinew, right? To kind of hold things in place. Uh, so that would be one thing they might have done with these. So if it was notched, that's probably um, what they did with it, but not all uh, points that you find are notched on the edges like this. Um, here's again some of those little tiny bird points. Um, you can see that these guys were pretty good at what they did. That's not um, an easy thing to make without that little tiny piece of rock breaking or you know chipping in the wrong place. So those are a little difficult to do, I'm sure. Now, once these um, through time and use wear down uh, and the edges are no longer sharp or sharp enough to, uh, to kill, right? They would take one of these abraders, which we saw in the little plastic case there. This is an artifact uh, made out of sandstone. So it's found in an archeological site just like this. So we did not add uh, any of those marks in this piece of sandstone. So imagine this as um, something like a piece of sandpaper, what we would use sandpaper for, right? To, to smooth off rough edges. They would use it as a sharpening tool, okay? So since it's rough uh, and it's a piece of sandstone, they would take those points uh, and scrapers and spears and run them back and forth through there. They may even um, take, you know, bark off of a, a, a stick in order to use it for, uh, or turn it into an arrow, okay, to prepare it that way. So we find abraders sometimes at archeological sites. So they even had ways of sharpening uh, these tools once they had them made. back to the bison for a minute um, and what uh, size of animal that is. I have one bison hide here covering this entire uh, eight foot table, eight foot plus. Uh, it was a large animal. So obviously that would not be something you would want to just run up to, to try and hunt it, right? Um, so that would be very dangerous. They could turn on, on them very easily and, and kill a person. Um, without too much trouble. So uh, this, uh, this next tool uh, does have a, a stone point on it, of course, that's your arrow, but the, the throwing part here is called the atlatl. And I'm not very good at this, but uh, the whole idea with the atlatl is so that that person can keep their distance from that really large animal so that they don't get charged in the process of uh, trying to hunt them. So you can use this as kind of a launching um, apparatus, I guess you would call it. So the arrow gets launched and you hang on to the atlatl, right? So you hope that the arrow goes into the animal. They can track that down eventually, but you, you hang on to the atlatl. So this was something um, that they used to, to help them not have to get so close um, to those really large animals and put themselves in danger. So that's called the atlatl. That's A-T-L, A-T-L. So those are some of the lithics or the stone tools here that we've seen. Uh, anything that is made out of clay, um, like I mentioned, would be considered ceramics. And we've got some ceramics uh, right here in the case behind you guys can see some of the pots there. Um, here are some examples of the different types of ceramics that we find at archeological sites. So um, like the points, 
um, the, the ceramics can tell you a little bit about the culture as well. So that we, we know now at this point in time that um, different cultures had different looking types of pottery. So when we find pieces of pottery, we can, um, for the most part, identify what culture left it there. Um, so different cultures that were here in Northwest Iowa, you can see here from the name, we had woodland um, culture here. We had Mill Creek, which we've been talking about here quite a bit. Uh, and we had Oneota here as well. So all slightly different times, um, but all basically in this part of Northwest Iowa. So this gives you an idea of how different um, their pottery can look. So Mill Creek, which is what we've been talking about here, always had very um, nicely done pottery. So this was a, a culture that took, um, took their time in their pottery and their decorating of it. So here's a nice rim piece uh, from the Mill Creek culture. Usually fairly thin, but well done. Okay, very nicely decorated. Most of the time Mill Creek is. So you can look for that design and, and identify it as Mill Creek. And here's another nice rim. So they took time with their pottery. Woodland folks. Um, not so much. I <laughs> didn't spend a lot of time decorating. Um, this would probably be what they would call cord impressed. So not necessarily cord. I've got cord wrapped on a stick here, but they may have instead used, um, you know, grass reeds wrapped around a stick and then just simply uh, press that into the wet clay to get their design. So didn't take the time with a, a you know, a sharp stone or even a bone tool to make the nice decorations like they did in the Mill Creek Pottery. So woodland looks a little bit different, also were in this area. Um, and Oneota, if you could tell back here from the box, uh, probably doesn't show up very well, but this one stands out different from the other two uh, in the fact that it's got little tiny pieces of crushed up shell, clam shell, mixed in with the clay. So this particular group like to uh, mix in little pieces of, of clam shell with their um, pottery as they were making it. So usually you can identify Oneota um, from that, from the clam shell. So um, that's kind of an interesting one to look at too. Now this one down here, or these two that you see here, those are called effigies. So an effigy, um, different cultures used these or incorporated them into their ceramics. And what they are, um, we find all sorts of different effigies, and I guess you guys can kind of guess, make your own guesses at these. But here's one. This was incorporated right into the edge of a, uh, of, a of a pot, right? The rim of a pot. Uh, probably uh, we go with on this one usually a bird of prey. So maybe an eagle, maybe a hawk. I think that looks like a beak there. Owl possibly. So effigy usually was uh, an animal of importance to this. Group. Whether it was a bird of prey, we find frogs, we find bears, we find um, dog-like creatures, I think, at times. So um, important enough to these folks to incorporate them into their pottery. So maybe they um, worship them as god-like creatures. We're not exactly sure what the effigies mean to them, but know that they must have been um, important in some way, important enough to um, include them in some of their ceramic items here. So if you ever find anything like this, this is called an effigy. And lastly, you're just looking quickly at the pot, which will uh, lead us into uh, part two, if you guys stick with us here on the pottery puzzle uh, activity itself. This is what we're going to be working with. So uh, keep in mind, after all that's been discussed here today and all seeing all these neat artifacts, um, Archaeology is not always finding all of the missing pieces. So we'll put it that way. Think of it in terms of uh, a puzzle, okay? And putting a puzzle back together, um, it's a horrible feeling when you get down to the last, you know, three pieces of your puzzle and they're missing, right? You can't finish it. So it happens all the time in archaeology, especially with something like um, a very fragile clay pot. So you can imagine these don't lay around on the ground and stay in one piece usually. So in archeology, span quite often, you are missing pieces to the puzzle and that is common. So 
You can see here up close, hopefully, which pieces are the actual artifact pieces, right? The ones that have the decoration in. I believe those are Milk Creek uh, pieces of pottery. But look what happens when we get around to the backside. None of that part of the pot was found, right? Except the rim up here. So the museum was left to try and figure out, you know, what was the shape of this pot? What did it look like when it was whole? And again, we're missing um, a good amount of the pieces. So we're not sure if this is correct. Maybe the bottom was supposed to be a little more flat. Uh, maybe it wasn't supposed to be this big. We're not exactly sure, although we got um, a good amount of the rim pieces here to guess on the size. But that is kind of how um, archaeology goes. We don't have all of the answers because we don't have all of the pieces most of the time. So stay with me here. We'll go to part two and we'll work on the actual activity that we would have been doing with you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Here is uh, still on the lower level of the museum or a prehistoric Mill Creek village and what that might look like. This is called a diorama. Um, so in it, you can actually look down into the window here and see what um, a prehistoric site may have looked like. So um, hopefully you see some familiar things there that we just talked about. You can see how their um, houses were built, like we talked about with the mud and the grass thatch roofs. Um, the post, you can see one of them right there in the middle, looks like it maybe just burnt down, uh, which happened probably uh, quite often, right? And you have a fire inside of your home in a fire pit, right? Um, in the back, if you look back there in the hillside, um, we've got somebody there digging uh, for clay uh, in the hillside there to make some ceramic pots with. And somebody in the back there hunting. There's a spear. Another fire pit back here. And maybe somebody fishing along um, the stream here. Okay, here we've got somebody tending to their crops. Remember, we talked about them being um, farmers. Okay, so they would mound up their their hills of beans and squash and pumpkins uh, and take care of those. We've got some folks down here working on uh, preparing animal hides. So they had been hunting. And they would use all parts of that animal. Um, eat the meat, of course. We know how they uh, would turn uh, the hide, of course, into clothing and, and blankets and so on. They use the bones uh, and turn those into tools. Um, every part, even the, the parts that were not so much edible, they learned to find uh, uses for. So that's our Mill Creek Village. In this case, we have our um, stone tools, uh, which was right behind me here as we were doing the program. Here's some of those um, abrader tools that we talked about for sharpening and smoothing off um, bumps and things on the sticks. Got some um, ground grinding tools here and the hammerheads, the mauls, mano matate that I showed you for grinding of the corn. There's a drill in the back, making a hole. Got some of those scraping tools to get the um, flesh and hair off of the hides to prepare them. Um, and the process itself of flint napping. You see this uh, person here taking a larger stone and hitting it against a smaller one there to make these flakes uh, or smaller pieces that I mentioned in the flint napping process. So that's the beginning step, step one. Okay, here we are in the bone tool area. Um, seeing some of the same things I shared with you here, the scapula there, we believe that was probably used as a hoe, um, like the gal is using there. Here we've got some of those awls, which were the leather punches or needle type tools. So sometimes made of bird bone, maybe even um, rib bones that are sharpened up. So those would be used just like you're seeing there on the hides. Here are some larger ones that would be rib bones. 
down here in front, this is um, a hollowed out uh, leg bone of a larger animal. You can see they've kind of even um, grooved uh, some teeth into the end of it. This is called a, a flesher, uh, which was a, a used as a scraping tool um, to, to strip off those fatty tissues from the hides. You're fleshing the hide. That was made out of bone. And here you see another bone tool, a smaller bone tool. Um, I showed you in the, in the uh, smaller plastic case um, for shaping uh, wet clay in the process of, of pottery making to get nice uniform um, pots. Whether you wanted a, maybe a flat bottom to your pot, it would have had a flat edged bone um, to use, a bone tool to use for that. And this one happens to be a rounded edge. So there's some examples of bone tools and their uses. And here is our pottery case, a little bit closer here. Again, taking a look at um, some of the different cultures that were here in Northwest Iowa, just slightly different times. We talked about woodland um, and Mill Creek and Oneota. Here's the clam shell in theirs quite often. And another group that was here I didn't mention too much uh, about, Great Oasis was another culture that we had here in Iowa. So again, that helps us identify the culture if we can um, find pieces of their pottery. And again, remember most of the time we don't find all of the pieces to the pot. That would be really unusual. You can see how um, these have been finished up with the missing pieces there. We can tell where those are. But fairly complete. That's all part of archaeology.